when I'm driving somewhere and I have to get myself in the mood, I'll still put the Ninth Symphony on. And some of the other yeah, ones Yeah, it's like, the, well. it's like encountering the terrible force of good. You know, you think about Moses in the burning bush it's, or, yeah. or, or Jacob wrestling with God. It's like, well, why is it a burning bush? Why is it terrifying? Why do you wrestle with God? Why do you get hurt? It's yeah. like, well, because good in its full force has this unbelievable, it has this integration of power. And it's yeah. no wonder it terrifies people because it just burns everything away in comparison. Right, right. right. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the, the new book that I'm writing about, which is The Sublime, is, as I'm talking mm -hmm. about, it's a combination of two emotions of, of both kind of pain and pleasure, of excitement mm -hmm. and fear at the same time. Um, so you're confronting something that kind of intimidates you, but is so awesome that you can't, you know, you're just overwhelmed. And the confluence of two emotions opposing emotions at the same time is very very powerful for a human being yeah i've just written a book that i'm going to publish next year that's called an abc of childhood tragedy and it's a combination uh -huh. of dark humor and beauty it's the yeah. same we're trying to we're experimenting with exactly the same thing those that paradoxical juxtaposition of dark and light emotions there is something yeah. sublime about that that's and something awe-inspiring about that it's, I guess it's, it's part of bringing what's dark into the light or subsuming it under the light, maybe. So why, yeah. did you get, why the sublime? What are you pursuing there? And well, what's the reason, um, you know, the, the ultimate in sublime is to me, so the way I look at it is being a human being and being socialized is a kind of a world, there's a limit, a circle that we have to live inside certain codes and conventions that we have to abide by. And we all do that. And the codes and conventions for 5th century BC China are not the same as what we have now, but there's still that limit. And what humans are attracted to what lies beyond that limit. It's just part mm -hmm. of our nature. It's a first part of it. And when we explore beyond the social limits and codes and things we're supposed to do and ways we're supposed to act, it's deeply exciting and thrilling. But there's also that element of fear involved, right? See, I think that's a better, that's a better, what would you call it, formulation than Nietzsche's idea of will to power, is the uh -huh. desire to exist on that sublime edge. And, and that is the, yeah. the, the, bear, the border between order and chaos that you're describing, yeah. right? You, yeah. you want, and the, the, the thing, and that is the source of meaning itself. I mean, that's why I think music is so powerful is because it plays with predictable forms, but continually yeah. adds that level of unpredictability, a beautiful, yeah. you know how in any kind of music, the simplest music, someone who's good at it, country music, you know, there'll be a key shift or a twang on the string or something. That or something moves. discordant. Yes, exactly. And, and then yeah. and, and integrated within a, sort of a higher, uh, what a higher unity. And yeah. it's deeply meaningful. It puts you on yeah. that edge of the sublime. And, and, yeah. and we are, we do find the meaning that helps sustain us in life exactly at that place. That's that's something more yeah. deeply real than anything else. Well, so and, and sort of the ultimate thing beyond that limit is is death itself. And the word sublime means up to the threshold of a door or sublimin, limin being the mm -hmm. limit. Right, like and subliminal. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, I... Uh, I've been meaning to write this book for 15 years and I got distracted. But then about three years ago, I nearly died myself. I had a stroke and um, I came, you know, just an inch away from dying myself. I was driving my car. And so some of the experience, the near death experience and what it kind of taught me and how it sort of remained with me three years later and how I kind of feel it in my bones and how it's altered how I look at the world and everything around me is to me the kind of the ultimate sublime experience. So now, unfortunately, I'm able to write about this in a way that's actually very personal and experiential mm. instead of just purely intellectual. And Why um, unfortunately? Because of the price you had to pay for it? Yeah, the price is I can't take a walk. I can't do the, the swim. I can't do the things that I used to love. So, mm. you know, I'm kind of, I can, I can, you know, I'm functional. I can walk around the house, but I can't take a hike. And I can't uh -huh. do my long distance swimming or my mountain biking or anything like that. So I, I paid a price, but I'm alive. Yeah, um, well, and it was um, so interesting that that was, it was in the aftermath of that devastating experience that you decided to turn particularly to the sublime. Yeah. Well, it's because I've been wanting to write the book for a long time, and I knew that it has to do a little bit with the feeling of death, 
you know, um, and what, kind I of don't that's, understand that. So wh why that? Why make that as? I'm not disputing it. I don't. Yeah. I just don't understand. Like, I mean, you talked also about fifty cents brush with death, but yeah. why does the sublime in in your estimation? Why is it tangled up with the with the idea of death? Well, because there's there's a limit that, that limit and experiencing the limit gives you that sense of excitement and fear at the same time. Well, death is the ultimate limit. And to have gone up to that door and glimpsed to the other side and literally felt it in your bones and literally feel your bones melting away as you kind of go into a coma, you know, is like I went up to that door. I actually peered inside of it. Now, other people have had much stronger near-death experiences. Mine was more of the milder sort, but still, I peered <laughs> as far as as far as near death experiences go. Well, relatively minor. <laughs> well, you know, my my coma my coma lasted an hour or something. Some people, you know, there. Ah, uh, that's it's... nothing, man. Experts they have comas for like three years. <laughs> well, okay, all right. Um, I could have had a you know a, a more intense near death experience, but it was pretty intense. Yeah, it anyway, sounds like it was sufficient. It is, but sort of. The sense of life is almost too much. It's overpowering in its immediacy. And we humans try and kind of dull the, 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 the razor edge so much so that we can live. But if you think about, you know, your mortality on a day-to-day -day basis, and if you try and actually experience the immediacy of life and how dangerous it actually is and how it's fraught with all of these, these you know, these, these things that you don't want to confront, is is very 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 powerful and I'm sorry Siri just keeps hearing me I'm so <laughs> so annoying so um, you know it, it creates so when you have that it's it's like the ultimate it's a mix of you know they they call in French the orgasm mm -hmm. le petit mort mm -hmm. right right so an orgasm is almost like a little death you know. So that sense of it's almost too much, it's almost like death itself, like something so pleasurable can actually kind of morph into something a little bit frightening as well. Something a little bit like you're, like you're exploring something that you're not supposed to oh, be Oh, you see that in the ease in which laughter and tears can be interchanged, yeah. right? You see that with children, yeah. they can switch from laughter to tears in no time. And, you know, right. you can laugh so hard that you cry and... It's often too when you're crying about something sorrowful that someone can say something funny and it'll switch to laughter. And that's all a right. way down at the level of instinct, right? Where these right. And it's so interesting to see the opposites touch at that level. Yeah. So, so the reason why I'm doing the Eleusinian mysteries, just to bring that back, is uh, I have a chapter on pagan religions on what I call the pagan sublime, and I'm trying to cr uh, tell the reader that. It, we don't have a right conception of ancient religions. They're actually very different from what we think. We have these kind of cliched notions of kind of mischievous gods cavorting in clouds and doing all kinds of naughty things that are very human and just kind of almost a silliness to it. Like, whoa, we're so beyond that. But actually, pagan religions were extremely serious and they were based on creating go away, Siri. And they were, and they were, and they were based on um, creating very powerful emotional responses in people. And that was what primal religion was about or ancient religion was about. It wasn't based on texts, on dogma, on the written word. So the Eleusinian mysteries, because there are mysteries, because nobody ever wrote about it. There's no text. There's nothing written that we can go to. Yes, there's the hymn to Demeter that kind of maybe describes a little bit of what it's based on. But we don't know really what happened because nothing was ever written down. It was simply about creating this overwhelming emotional reaction in which you took the, the initiates to the edge of death. You made them experience death in life which is the story of Demeter and Persephone. We were like making them feel as if they had gone into the underworld itself. And that created a whole new relationship to life. But I wanted the, this idea that religion isn't this kind of milk toasty thing that people think about nowadays. It was initially an extremely powerful reaction to human vulnerability, to our weakness in this immense cosmos with all of these very powerful forces. And the religious rituals were to actually mirror that and give you a kind of compensatory sense that you could control it, you could contain it within these kind of powerful experiences. Oh, it's really interesting to me that you yeah. know you've you've come through your analysis of the darkness 
Yeah. And then a consequence of that was to be motivated to pursue the sublime. You know, yeah. it, and the, the little stamp that I'm using for these kids' book, uh, which I'm doing with this illustrator named Juliet Fogra, who's a real genius in my estimation, uh -huh. we made a stamp, and the motto on the stamp is, through the darkness into the light. And, wow. In, you know, and there's this old idea that if you look into the darkness enough, you'll find something that compensates for it, right? And that emerges right. out of the darkness that's greater and more powerful than the darkness. And that part, part of the looking into the dark side of you yourself is you find the power that enables you to deal with mortality. And there is wow. something sublime about that. It's so cool that, you know, all your yeah. work investigating yeah. and trying to integrate the shadow has led you to this to this what 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 that your intuition has been gripped by the idea of the sublime yeah Isn't necessarily never, where you think you'd end up well yeah a lot of the um impetus for the book is another little bit of anger as well because i always have to have some anger in order to feel the you know the impulse to write and just discipline myself and my anger now is about how people's worlds have become so tight and so banal and so limited where they're just kind of disappearing into their phones and their world is, is just sort of programmed for them by, by Facebook or social media. And they're sort of told what they're supposed to think and they're kind of programmed. And at the same time, you know, what science is discovering about the universe and about where we live and about who we are it's just so insanely mind blowing. It's just absolutely almost inc it's sublimed in my opinion. And yet so many people are just living like as if they're sleepwalking as if that, you know, I talk in, in one chapter about the unlikeliness of any of us being alive, any of us actually being here right now on earth and how just to, just to be who we are, the odds against it are like 8 trillion to one. I mean, even more than that. And, but people aren't thinking about this. They're, they're not aware of the awesomeness of just the fact of being alive, of the cosmos as it evolved, as, as things on earth evolve the way they are. And so I'm kind of, I'm kind of angry uh, a little bit about how, about how people are just not aware of this. Not well, yeah, that anger again, that's, you know, one of the things I did as a clinician is to help people find their purpose was to, to help them find out what they're angry about. It's like, well, what's your problem? You know, you say that, yes. someone, what's your problem? But actually you want to know. It's like, because if you have a problem, then, because there's lots of things you could be bothered about, but you're not bothered about by all of them. Right. There's something that stands out for you as, you know, something that violates your sense of moral propriety, let's say. That's your right. problem. You think, well, I don't right. want to have a problem. It's, yes, you do. You want to have your yeah. problem, and then you want to go try to solve it. And if you're right. looking for meaning in your life, it's like, well, what bugs you? Well, I'm annoyed at this and that. And, and you know, it, it's pretty naive and low resolution and formulaic to begin with. But you could zero right in on that, and then you find the purpose of your life. And that's, it, that's in that anger. It's in that anger, at least to some degree. Yeah, and as I said, I can't write without it. I don't know why. Every day I have to feel a little bit, of, a little bit of pinch of it, or like a little yeah. bit of edge of that knife in me. And and sometimes, yeah, you know, well, you have to be. That's right. I mean, I find when I'm sitting down to write a chapter because it's hard to sit down and and, and write a it chapter. Is. It's a lot of work, man. And you know, writers always whine about that, but it is hard to. Do. It's hard to do. It's as hard as clinical work, which is the hardest work I ever did. And so, wow. but I have to be. It's like there has to be a reason for this. You know, yeah. to get me going to do it. It has to be important. Yeah. And that means it has to be dealing with something weighty. And if it's weighty, it's gonna it's gonna act, it's gonna what what what's gonna call out of you all of your emotional responses, including the well, certainly including anger. Certainly that's a tremendous form of energy. Well, I don't know if you have the same experience, but I read so many books uh, for my research, et cetera, and that's the main thing that I fault them with. They're, there's no kind of energy behind it. There's no human behind it. There's no voice that's kind of screaming out why do they have to yeah, say right. this. Screaming it's, out is exactly right. That's a great book, Screams. Like Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. That's amazing. like 3,000 pages of screaming anger. It's like yeah. you sustain screaming anger for 3,000 pages. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's like being caught in a yeah. windstorm reading that book. Yeah. And that's yeah. no wonder that greatness is terrifying. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of channeling the dark side in some ways. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, just, I mean, that man brought down a totalitarian state, at least in part. It's like, you yeah. have to have a lot of force and you think that no, there's not going to be anger in part to, to push back against that's all that kind of petty tyranny that you were talking about in, in its, right. in its most, what would you say? Most rigidified and, and universal form. And yeah. one man, you know, who decided he was going to tell the truth and, 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 and harnessed that passion to his words changed yeah. the world.